So good morning, everyone. Uh, we are happy to be here in this uh, very starting, uh, the, the last day, of official day of IGF of 2023, with this very relevant conversation about how we can leverage the Freedom Online Coalition uh, at the International Organization for the work uh, and, and, and support um, the exercise of rights. So for this conversation, I am Maria Pascanales. I am the head of uh, legal policy and research at Global Partners Digital, and I have the pleasure to be the moderator and uh, be joined by a distinguished panel of representatives from the governments of Canada, United States, and the Netherlands that um, hold the, the chair of the uh, Free Online Coalition uh, in the previous periods, in the current period, and it, it will be taking over <laughs> for the following one in the case of the Netherlands. And also for distinguished members of the um, uh, advisory network of the Freedom Online Coalition that represent civil society organizations and also bring their perspective to this very important conversation about how uh, uh, we can discuss more about the opportunities and challenges of using the FOC to shape global norms and advocate for human rights defenders, civil society, journalists, and other stakeholders in multilateral institutions and processes. So very relevant conversation for all the moving parts that we are confronting in this moment. And because of that, uh, my, my opening remark, I want to concentrate uh, in this idea of like the interoperability that we usually associate with more technical concept. But today we are seeing like more than ever the need of like ensuring interoperability also regarding frameworks and regarding efforts. So how we can leverage the experience of collaboration at the multilateral level, but also with all the experience and the richness that come from the uh, multi-stakeholder engagement, which is the natural strength of the Free Home Online Coalition. So in that sense, um, it's very important like remind that for achieving the truly uh, the true interoperability that we need to have common object objectives and the free online coalition precisely have championed uh, the identification of common goals common uh, objectives of the like-minded uh, state that are united in this coalition and also uh, have championed the idea of like progressively enlarge and welcome more diversity in that participation with recently new uh, state joining the, the Free Online Coalition. One of those uh, very relevant common objectives is the approach to protect and promote human rights that unite all the members of this relevant coalition and, and make it through this uh, slogan that many of the human rights advocates in the digital sphere, we pursuit from many years ago, I make it the same uh, rights valid online and offline. E, and for this, it's not necessarily imperative to establish entirely new regulations. Sometimes we need uh, to take advantage of what uh, already we have developed in many frameworks. And for that, uh, consistently, the, the advisory network has been supporting uh, also the work of the government in trying to leverage all the advocacy work and the experience and the, uh, and, and the interpretation that come from the international human rights system in order to enhance this collaboration and promote more effective uh, protection of rights. With that note, I want to give uh, the floor for, uh, to the relevant people uh, in this conversation, um, uh, the, the ones that represent, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the past experience in leveraging the, the value of this network, um, the ones that represent the present experience, and the ones that come with a lot of new plans and hopes and, and uh, new brand possibilities for continuing this very fruitful collaboration. So first, we will welcome uh, Ms. Irene Su, who is the representative from the Canadian government, uh, to give her a little bit of uh, her thoughts in terms of the experience of the uh, Canadian government leading the efforts of the FOC. Please, Irene. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, so I'll speak a bit about Canada's experiences. Um, so we were the chair during the 2022 year, um, and before that, um, in the lead up to 
um, the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI. We were the chair of the task force on um, AI and human rights. Um, and before uh, the negotiations really started, uh, we thought that we had to take a proactive and deliberate approach uh, to having a multi-stakeholder discussion um, that would inform um, all of our engagement in the negotiations. Um, so we had started with a briefing from UNESCO um, to the FOC Paris uh, Diplomatic Network, um, which we our mission in UNESCO, our mission to UNESCO also leads um, that diplomatic network. Um, the benefits of the FOC is that even though uh, we're very like-minded in terms of values and principles, it is fairly cross-regional um, with differing levels of capacity and knowledge on these issues. Um, so that first briefing was really important to get everyone on the same page about what was at stake and the main issues um, and UNESCO's goals for the recommendation. Um, and then really from there, it was very much an iterative and sometimes messy process. Um, we had regular meetings uh, within the task force um, involving countries, civil society, and tech companies in the advisory network. Um, and really, uh, it was really helpful um, because these issues are necessarily um, multidisciplinary um, and we're used to that when we're formulating national negotiating positions, having to talk to different departments, civil society, industry. Um, and, uh, and so you had to bring together people with policy experience, with multilateral experience, with the technical expertise, um, and very few people who know all three um, and try to uh, bring those together. Um, even in the negotiations themselves, which were unfortunately all virtual uh, due to COVID, um, some delegations, it was very much a multi-stakeholder negotiation. Uh, even some delegations represented by professors with expertise in AI. Um, and so you had to do a lot of translating between the different communities. But that's why the FOC was such a valuable um, place to do that coordination, bringing all those communities together. Um, and then just maybe some lessons learned. Like I said, um, to be inclusive, a multi-stakeholder really needs to be a deliberate and proactive decision from the start. Um, it's not going to happen on its own. Um, plan, to ha plan, plan that it will take more time than you think it will take. Um, the issues are complex. Um, there's always going to be tensions. And uh, as we like to say, if you're not uncomfortable, you're probably not being inclusive enough. Um, and uh, we also all just need to, I think it's not, as governments, it's not always our natural tendency um, to want to be consultative, but that's why it needs to be um, a deliberate decision to kind of step out of normal practices to make that happen. Thanks. Thank you very much, Erin. And in, on that note about the value the, of the multi-stakeholder engagement and even the value of like feeling a little bit uncomfortable, and uh, which is the job of the civil society in general in these processes, I would like to bring to the conversation Veronica Ferrari from uh, APC, Association uh, for Progressive Communication, uh, who is a member of the advisory network, um, to to comment a little bit about the benefits of this multi-stakeholder dialogue and uh, what had been the experience of like championing this uh, through the work of the advisory network in collaboration with the F FOC. Great, thanks Maripaz uh, and thanks for, for the um, remarks from Canada um, and also the leadership in, in incorporating the, the inclusion agenda and putting that at the center of the FOC uh, that was continued under the US chairship and we hope it will be continued in the next chairship. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, today, for the invitation. I'm, I'm glad to be here, uh, as Maria Paz was saying. I am a member of the advisory network, where I represent APC. APC is an international civil, civil society organization, but we are also a network of members from all over 40 countries located mostly in the global majority. Um, so we are a network committed to co-creating a just and sustainable world, um, by supporting people to use and shape the internet. Um, so APC advocates and works towards more robust and meaningful uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration, where those who are affected by digitalization and digital policies 
particularly marginalized groups, uh, have a voice in shaping policy at national, regional, and, and also um, international levels. So in this sense, APC sees the FOC as a valuable platform um, to advance this goal of multi-stakeholder collaboration. So as, as I just said, the increases emphasis at the FOC on digital inclusion, on incorporating the voice of marginalized groups, um, we think is a really positive step um, where engagement with communities who are most affected is, is required. So there is more to be done in that sense. So I think I wanted to highlight the, the role of the task forces and the sub-entities as good examples of multi-stakeholder collaboration within the FOC in addressing a specific focus areas and also in translating principles and statements into practical actions. Um, so, for example, in the case of AI, we believe that when discussing norms related to artificial intelligence and emerging technologies, from our perspective, from APC, the focus should be on the implication of these systems for human rights, for social justice, also for sustainable development. So the norms discussion should not be only around technology, but also about the inequalities that these technologies can create or even exacerbate. Um, so from the FOC, working on decisions on new emerging technologies and AI is key to work with the TFER, but also with the Digital Equality Task Force um, to incorporate perspectives uh, from marginalized groups. Um, so the role of the sub-entities has been has been key in shaping FOC priorities, the program of work, also informing discussions on these issues through learning opportunities, uh, and also serve as a mean to engage other groups that are not, uh, not necessarily part of the FOC and the advisory network. Um, and I wanted to bring an example of, of which we believe in terms of setting norms that build on multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, I wasn't part of the FOC at that moment, but my colleagues from APC were really involved in this. Um, is the FOC joint statement on the human rights impact of cybersecurity laws, practices, and policies from 2020? So that statement contains recommendations for national cybersecurity practices and international processes um, and draw on the input of a multi-stakeholder FOC working group on that uh, topic. So that statement underscores the importance of, of a human-centric approach to cybersecurity, the need to build on international human rights frameworks um, when, when shaping international cyber norms and also national policies. So this leads to, to my final point. Uh, we believe that the FOC could play a key role in coordinating international discussions, for example, on cybersecurity and cybercrime, because particularly at the UN and some of the processes they are building on language and positions that are already there, that exist, and there is consensus about that. Um, so uh, that was one of the points that I wanted to mention. And then I know that we are talking about more processes and connections, so I may stop here. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight the importance of multi-stakeholder collaboration, how FOC has proven as a key platform for that, and how we can still do better and more in that sense. So thank you, Marapaz. Thank you very much, Veronica, for those remarks. And now I'm going to give the floor to uh, Alison Peters, who is the representative of the U.S. government that have hold uh, in this period the chairship of the FOC to also share a little bit more about uh, this uh, engagement through diplomatic efforts and how you have tried to provide more efficacy also to this coordination, which is always a challenge when when a group starts and it's small, it's easier maybe, but when you need to accommodate and welcome new members and new realities and new contexts, there are challenges in the coordination itself. So share a little bit of the US government leading that experience during the last shareship of the FOC. Uh, well, first, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Maria. Uh, it's really a pleasure on the last day of IGF to be joined by uh, two very close friends, partners uh, in crime, the government of Canada and the governments of Netherlands, uh, as well as our friend Veronica from the advisory network of this global coalition focused on human rights online. Um, the United States has been really just tremendously thrilled to be the chair of this global coalition this year. Um, we set out at the first summit for democracy to bolster both our engagement and work through the Freedom Online Coalition, um, but bolster the work of the coalition as a whole in terms of impacting multilateral processes, multi-stakeholder processes around the globe focused on, on technology-related issues. 
Um, I think we learned a lot of hard lessons. Uh, we saw both challenges and successes. Um, I think perhaps the most important lesson learned for us is the need to have very strong political will um, at the top of, of our leadership chain as the chair of this coalition. Um, we had a presidential commitment to chair the coalition. Um, we've had engagement from our Secretary of State. We recently hosted a ministerial level conversation at the UN General Assembly High Level Week. Um, we've been able to bring in more members uh, into the coalition as a result of that strong engagement and political leadership at the top of our chain. Um, advancing a rights respecting approach to technology related issues um, is central to the Biden administration's approach on, on technology policy. Um, and so that has really helped us as the chair make sure that we are continuing to, to sort of hold ourselves accountable and getting a lot done this year. Um, certainly we saw a lot of successes in terms of building the capacity of the Freedom Online Coalition during our chairship. Um, perhaps uh, most importantly, building up our diplomatic networks, um, both in Geneva and New York, and working to expand those in, in other cities as well, um, in order to coordinate in advance of some really key multilateral processes. So we've coordinated through the Freedom Online Coalition in New York around the UN Cybercrime Treaty negotiations, for example, working closely with the advisory network to bring in their perspectives in those treaty negotiations. Um, we've coordinated through the Freedom Online Coalition in advance of um, an emerging technology resolution being considered in the Human Rights Council, making sure also that we're talking through what uh, priorities and, and perhaps threats to human rights are most critical in terms of uh, addressing in any such resolution in the Human Rights Council. Um, there's been coordination uh, in UNESCO around the guidance for digital platforms, um, making sure also that we're bringing in the, the perspectives of the advisory network there in particular, as there's been very strong views amongst uh, multi-stakeholders on, on that process in particular. Um, the second piece I think that we've seen in terms of, of successes is really making sure that we are giving opportunities for members to facilitate coordination, not just in capital cities, uh, but also through our embassies um, in countries around the globe. Um, there perhaps is uh, most critical when we're talking about responses to threats to human rights online, so particular cases of internet shutdowns or particular cases where we've seen um, human rights defenders be targeted by digital attacks, um, making sure that we are strengthening our coordination in those countries directly with our diplomats that are serving at our embassies has really been um, perhaps a, a key success of ours in our chairship this year. Um, and then third, I'll just say in terms of a success, I think we have been um, successful in bringing in new issue sets into the Freedom Online Coalition, continuing to evolve. We had um, the entire Freedom Online Coalition uh, issue a joint statement um, in the Human Rights Council, most recently looking at the threat of surveillance technologies. We were able to gain uh, a host of additional governments. Uh, we're so pleased, I, I think the number is nearly 60 now that have joined on. So we've taken this issue set, we've coordinated in this coalition, and then we've taken it out to other governments to join us. Um, similarly, we issued a set of guiding principles on government use of surveillance technologies. Um, there are, of course, I don't need to tell many of you in this room, a suite of surveillance technologies that are front and center in terms of the threats to human rights defenders, journalists, um, political opposition figures, dissidents, uh, you name it. Um, this is a particular threat when uh, we talk about artificial intelligence systems embedded in those surveillance technologies, and we have been successful in developing these guiding principles on government use of surveillance tech that really sort of establishes what our rights respecting uh, use would look like when it comes to these technologies. Uh, we were pleased that the whole FOC joined on to these guiding principles, and then again, we were able to take that into the Summit for Democracy context and gain additional support. Um, certainly though, we're not without challenges and, and rooms for improvement. Um, 
I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is just linking human rights folks up with cyber and digital folks in each and every one of our governments. I'm sure we would all agree. Um, sometimes we, we can be siloed, and so the need to bring in both of those perspectives when we're making decisions um, and, and developing outputs of this coalition has, has really been a challenge for, for us and I think uh, every government at this table and in the FOC. Um, second challenge, of course, is visibility of the Freedom Online Coalition. There are a lot of coalitions out there. Um, I'm engaged in, in a number, uh, as I'm sure both of you are as well, um, and, and Veronica from the Advisory Network. And so making sure that we are keeping the Freedom Online Coalition sort of front and center in a lot of these policy discussions has been um, really a, a place where I think we continue to feel like there's room for improvement. Um, and then last I'll say, um, we continue to, to see room for improvement in terms of diversifying our membership, bringing in more countries from the global majority. Um, this is something that has been a critical priority for us. Um, to your point, Maria, not to grow this to um, too large of a size where coordination just becomes near impossible, um, but really to grow this um, it, with diversity of perspectives uh, in mind, so we are not just making decisions that impact governments in, in one region or another, but uh, we're making decisions that are holistic of, of the entire globe. Um, there, this continues to be a priority, and we look forward to working with the government of the Netherlands to, to bring in more members of the global majority into the conversation. Um, so I, I could probably go on with the challenges and areas for improvement, um, but we wouldn't be able to have achieved the successes that we did without the support of you all at the table and so many in this room in particular. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alison. And with that, I think this is a, the perfect segue <laughs> to Ambassador Ernst Norman, who represents the Netherlands, the new chairship of the Freedom Online Coalition for the following year. And um, precisely with all these relevant learns and experience that have been shared by, by your colleagues uh, that previously hold uh, the seat of the chairship, what are uh, your, your views and your perspective in terms of the challenges and the opportunities and the plans that uh, you bring as the new leadership of this coalition? Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. And so glad to be invited at this table as a newcomer. Uh, and it's fascinating to attend this, um, this uh, Internet Governance Forum and to meet so many people and have all these interesting discussions uh, like we have this morning uh, as well. And I want to have a special mention on this subject, uh, Guus van Zwol, who's sitting in front of me, uh, being responsible actually for all the work on the Freedom Online Coalition from our side. So thank you for that. And I want to thank uh, Aaron and Alison uh, for sharing your lessons learned uh, on the Freedom Online Coalition. Now, Canada has shown us how Freedom Online uh, Coalition policymakers can be trained on difficult technical uh, topics like artificial intelligence and how then this knowledge can be used in di diplomatic negotiations. Although written two years before the public launch of generative AI, the FOC joint statement on artificial intelligence and human rights still holds up. This is due to the fact that Canada organized during the pandemic virtual classes for the policymakers, where they were informed by experts in academia, tech companies, and NGOs on AI and machine learning. This knowledge base ensured that the FOC had an excellent position to coordinate this position around the UNESCO negotiations on AI and ethics. The US has done magnificent work on further energizing the FOC, and uh, Alison mentioned a number of issues uh, that have been brought on to the table. Like uh, you have uh, brought the FOC to the Summit uh, for Democracy and underlined at the highest level that digital human rights is one of the biggest challenges of our time. Also, the US uh, has done some important housekeeping on the coalition. With a new and updated terms of reference, the coalition is ready for the next 10 years. Although this might not be the most sexy subject from a PR perspective, it is most difficult for a diplomatic network. Getting everyone to agree on these changes was no small feat. So thank you very much for doing this important work. And it makes our work easier again. Thank you. 
Now it's up to us to continue these important lines of work and that in a key year for digital go uh, governance. The GDC, as we all have been seeing in the last few days, will be the internet governance event for next year, followed quickly by the WISIS plus 20. The next 18 months will be pivotal for the future of the internet and to make sure that we will be the internet we want. The Netherlands aims to keep the internet multi-stakeholder organized with a strong focus on human rights as a cross-cutting theme. For us, the FOC will be a key coalition to coordinate our positions in this important fora for three good reasons. First, the FOC has played a key role in earlier processes and has proven to be an essential force in protecting the multi-stakeholder model of the internet. And secondly, and possibly more important, the FOC is a global inter-regional coalition with countries from all continents. As we hear have heard in the last few days, digital equality and expanding connectivity are still a challenge not sufficiently addressed by the past IGFs. If we want to move forward on internet and AI governance, we must include a global majority perspective. We will therefore seek to broaden FOC's uh, memberships, I would say further expand, because you've done excellent work already on that uh, topic, but especially with like-minded countries from the global majority and having engaged actively in the discussions. Having the FOC presidency, we want to make sure that the FOC's position in the GDC negotiations is widely supported and realistic. And thirdly, with the FOC, we have a long history of engaging with all the stakeholders. They are involved through the FOC advisory network and provide us, governments, with solicited and unsolicited advice on these important governance aspects. These elements of the FOC, our history, our expertise, our diverse membership and multi-stakeholder structure make the FOC an excellent coalition to coordinate our positions on the important themes such as internet governance and AI, but also other related topics such as how to implement the recently concluded declaration on the information integrity. Also on behalf of Canada, I would like to thank all countries who have supported this important declaration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I think that with that uh, final remark in terms of the value of the multi-stakeholder engagement for digital technologies governance, I would like to bring also someone uh, from the advisory network uh, that will join us online for making also more inclusive this conversation. So we have Boye uh, Adegoke from Paradigm Initiative that will provide some uh, additional remarks and thoughts about how we can think about uh, the, the multi-stakeholder model in terms of like the, the threat that today uh, are for th this model um, and the switching to multilateralism and how the value of this model, multi-stakeholder model supported so strongly as we have heard by the FOC, by the past, by the present, and by the future um, will be enhanced and, and, and could be an opportunity to continue to advocating in um, advancing the mission of ensuring human rights-based approach in all the digital uh, technologies governance. So, Boye, can you hear us and can you uh, bring your perspective? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I hope I'm um, audible, you can hear me over there. Um, Thank you very much for the opportunity for me to contribute to this conversation. And thanks to the Air Force Tree uh, opportunity for putting together this session and for asking me to you know, share perspective. I think a lot has been said. Uh, again, congratulations to the government of Netherlands for assuming the chairmanship and great work to the United States government for the, the amazing work that they, they've done in the past one year. Uh, a lot has been said during this conversation, and some of the things I was going to mention are already been mentioned, so I will just gladly skip those so that I can make uh, the other point. I think this, the, the point about uh, inclusivity has been stressed, uh, and that of multi-stakeholderism in terms of the power of FOC to bring uh, all of these to the, to the table. But I also want to say one of the importance of the 
FOC and one of the benefits that you know uh, the, the 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 globe can benefit from you know you know uh, leveraging what the FOC has done in the past year is that the FOC is also a platform with diverse expertise. Uh, so apart from the fact that the FOC has done a great job in ensuring inclusivity, in ensuring more stakeholderism, what you would also find within the NOC, FOC is a diverse kind of expertise. So even within different stakeholder groups, uh, you find different people coming with different expertise. For example, uh, I'm a member of the advisory network. I represent an organization, but I would say, tell you for free that even while I represent an organization, uh, even as an organization, we also represent a network of a number of other, you know, uh, civil society organizations focusing on different kinds of expertise within the digital inclusion and digital rights space, uh, you know, across across the globe. So I think this is also one of the benefits of, uh, or one of the value that the FOC can, can offer, you know, some of these uh, global processes in terms of setting global norms and, and, and all of that. Uh, but I also think something like that, I've seen, you know, working through the FOC is accountability. Uh, I think that uh, the FOC also has a very great level of, you know, accountability system uh, in terms of how the advisory network and the FOC uh, itself as a coalition in terms of how we engage in in developing, you know, statements, in, in developing comments on, on, on many processes that the FOC have been engaged in. Uh, and I think this is very great for, you know, for, for, for in terms of setting, uh, you know, uh, very reliable global norms in terms of creating very effective system. Uh, it can help pre prevent abuses of power and ensure that global norms are implemented, you know, effectively. I also think that uh, one other benefit that I see within this context is also legitimacy. A lot of the, uh, you know, statements that the FOC have put out have gone through a lot of rigorous process, you know, involving uh, its advisory network member and the FOC countries there and all the FOC nations themselves. Uh, so at the end of the day, what we have a lot of times is uh, we have legitimate outputs, and I think that this principle principle can also, you know, be mainstream. So, how, you know, a global norm are set in terms of getting that, uh, you know, legitimacy from, 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 from a various, you know, diverse group of, of stakeholders. So, these are a, a few, a few points that I think that are, you know, kind of uh, very, very relevant uh, or valuable in terms of how the FOC operates that I think that the global norm can, can benefit from. And, you know, very quickly before I, I keep quiet, uh, I also like to say that it's very important that I see that uh, we, we, we have to be very careful in terms of uh, how we set some of the digital policy or the digital norms that are being set uh, in, in the in, in this age and time uh, to avoid the mistakes of the past. Uh, there might be that temptation, you know, to absolutely resort to multilateralism. Uh, I, I I just come back from the uh, uh, from the the ad hoc session, uh, you know, on the on the cyber treaty that the UN is currently working on, and I see that temptation a lot of times to uh, to overly, you know, resort to multilateralism, uh, you know, by not giving civil society voices uh, enough opportunity to make contribution during some of these sessions. I was in the room, so I see this happen practically. So uh, I think that's something that that we need to be very careful of, and I think that's where FOC can also come in again because wh whether we like it or not, within the multi within the multilateralism setup that is always in equitable power dynamics uh, in multilateral forums, powerful nations may have disproportionate, uh, disproportionate influence, you know, potentially leading to norms that primarily serve their interests. Uh, similar, smaller or less powerful nations may have very limited ability to shape, you know, global norms to their advantage. And I think it, the, the FOC provides some sort of, you know, platform whereby uh, this can be mitigated to very large extents. Uh, I already mentioned the uh, accountability the other time, but I also want to mention uh, what I also call the problem of fragmentation and complexity because over time, uh, multilateralism can lead to a proliferation of agreements, treaties, and norms, creating a complex and sometimes uh, contradictory web of rules that can be challenging to navigate and implement. So I also think that the FOC can really, really come handy in terms of helping to to mitigate some of these challenges with multilateralism and also uh, making sure that the mistakes of, you know, assuming that nations can just come together and develop norms and develop, you know, rules to to, to guide, you know, uh, behaviors in the within the international context, uh, it, it can be it can be very problematic. And the FOC in that instance, I think, is also a very great platform 
that can help in terms of mitigating those type of challenges because uh, as a member of the foc i have seen how many of the processes that we've been involved in many of the you know uh, many of the involvement of the focs even in global processes uh, it has benefited a lot from inputs of the different members of, of the foc inputs from you know uh, from from diverse group input from uh, representation of diverse communities, et cetera, that, you know, the, the, the FOC embodies. So I think this is very important. And I think that it's just a great opportunity for the world to benefit or for the world to leverage the amazing work that is being done by the FOC. And I also see the FOC as also an evolving, emerging, you know, platform uh, that continues to improve, that continues to expand. So uh, it's it, at this point, I'll, I'll just put a stop to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Boye, for being part of this conversation today. <laughs> and I think that with your remarks, uh, we have also a good segue in opening a little bit more also the conversation to the ones in the table, but also uh, in the room um, and even participants online, if there are someone that want to jump in, in the conversation. Exploring a little bit more, like uh, Ambassador have reminded us, uh, the importance of the housekeeping. We have uh, heard from each one of the chairships, the, the past, the current, and, and the future about how important it's like to address the, the issue of coordination because even when uh, we can uh, agree in terms of the values and, and, and being like-minded in terms of the goal of like, promotion and protection of human rights uh, related to the digital technologies, this need an, an operational layer, <laughs> and that's the challenge uh, that is up to the, the coalition to figure out uh, every year for continue uh, developing the, the great work that had been doing. So in that sense, uh, in a more operative way, how we can think about what are the, the key subject matters or the processes that you identify as the one that will need to uh, be prioritized uh, in the following year for the improvement of diplomatic network coordination ahead of any relevant negotiation of any of these uh, identified processes. And in that, that same line, how can the FOC leverage its previous work and upcoming work to enhance the ability that governance processes have a meaningful inclusive approach of majority world voices uh, and, and this multi-stakeholder nature that we have discussed is at the essence of really uh, have a process that can be fully aligned with the best protection of human rights. So I invite anyone <laughs> around the table to react but also from the audience. You want to yeah. start it? Um, well, I think this is kind of um, the heart of this discussion today. We've had uh, several days now of IGF, um, and I think all of the processes that probably every single one of us would list have been on the agenda for IGF sessions this week. So um, we do have right now an ad hoc committee um, that is going between Vienna and New York negotiating a UN cybercrime treaty. Um, this is critical that we have a tightly scoped criminal justice instrument that protects you know, a rights respecting approach to the investigation of um, cybercrimes. Um, and they're having the Freedom Online Coalition be a key uh, voice and, and mechanism in which we can coordinate our, our perspectives amongst like-minded partners is going to be really critical. Um, we've heard a lot of discussion about the global digital compact process. Um, we have also, of course, looked ahead to WISIS Plus 20 as one of the, the central processes where internet governance issues are, are going to be on the agenda. Um, and then we have other processes that have been discussed, things like the High Level Advisory Board and artificial intelligence. Um, I think the, the key to each and every one of these processes is it's going to be mission critical, the most important thing that this coalition does to make sure that we are focused on protecting human rights online and that means protecting the existing human rights insurance that we have um, that guide all of our work um, in the UN system and in, in multilateral institutions. Um, and not taking us backwards. Um, so that's first and foremost, not undermining the existing frameworks that we have. 
Um, second, I think is going to be mission critical that we're focused on protecting marginalized and vulnerable groups. There continues to be efforts um, in multilateral fora, multi-stakeholder fora around the globe to um, undermine protections for women and girls in all their diversity, undermine protections for LGBTQI plus individuals, undermine protections for other mul marginalized and vulnerable groups. Um, and we can use this coalition to make sure that we are continuing at every turn to make sure that we are putting um, those groups uh, at the heart of the human rights agenda and that we are also making sure that we are co consulting with those stakeholders um, to make sure that we're representing their perspectives. Um, third, we heard a lot of discussion and I think um, Boye also talked a lot about this and the need to make sure that we're protecting the multi-stakeholder model. Um, we have processes in the United Nations that um, in some ways are inherently governmental because the United Nations is um, a composition of member states, um, but it is very critical that we are um, protecting efforts to ensure that multi-stakeholders can engage, um, and that means getting the, the modalities right for a number of those processes so multi-stakeholders are able to not just be there at the table, but actually meaningfully engage, and I've heard a lot of discussion here this week about that as well. Um, and then last, I'll just say, I think it, it's gonna be really critical that we are evolving as a coalition, that we are not just focused on sort of the traditional threats to internet freedoms that we've been um, looking to protect uh, since this coalition was founded over a decade ago, but that we are putting on the table um, new, new threats to human rights online. Um, so I spoke about some of our efforts on surveillance technologies. Certainly when we look to issues around artificial intelligence governance, um, both the opportunities and threats that we see there uh, to, to human rights. And so continuing to make sure that we are um, really evolving as a coalition and putting the most critical priorities on the table in these processes um, is going to be really important and we can't do that without the advisory network and those in this room and beyond here at IGF um, to make sure that they're holding us accountable to, to actually doing so. Thank you very much, Alison. I don't know if uh, any of the other representatives want to react. And also, Veronica, I think that maybe it will be very relevant to hear from you, like about particularly this challenge of like be truly inclusive and, and have a really uh, effective way to engage these marginalized communities that it's, it's a challenge, it's not easy. Like we know as civil society organization that we work, we, we are not even we are representative in so many cases of these uh, marginalized communities' interests and perspective, but truly inclusive, inclusive means like to bring the affected people to the conversation, and that's itself a challenge. So, Veronica, your take on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Maribas. Yeah, I, I was listening to Alison, I just wanted to say plus one to some of the things. She just mentioned, so yeah, about in terms of priorities, cybercrime treaty negotiations, I uh, agree with that. Again, um, UN cybersecurity related processes like the Open Ended Working Group, we are seeing like language and human rights being weakened in negotiations. So that would be a good space for coordination, and, and the FOC could be a key platform for that. And we've been hearing in during these days how the next years are critical for internet governance. So again, as Alison saying, WISIS plus 20 as a key and foundational process uh, for internet governance at the IGF as the one of the main outcomes as a symbol for multi-stakeholder model and, and things that we need to, to protect as a community. Um, so another key process is, is the GC and the negotiations. Uh, we had a civil society meeting on day zero for coordination around the, the GDC and it was raised the need for multi-stakeholder and civil society participation in the GDC negotiations. And I, we also believe that the FOC can play a key role in facilitating that. Um, again, as Ali was saying, there are too many forums and initiatives to follow. So connections and, and, and more, a bit more coordination or, know, or knowing a bit more what's happening in all the con the, these coalitions and, and, and spaces. So I'm, I'm, I was thinking about the FOC, but also Tech for Democracy, the global partnership. Um, so how we can better coordinate around these efforts uh, since a lot of the organizations are following these same processes. Um, and I wanted to raise a point connected with Moon, the idea of meaningful inclusive approach and the idea of majority voices being heard 
and their perspectives being taken into account in the in the conversations. So I also heard during this week the need for inclusion thinking at the regional level. So multi-stakeholderism is not only about different stakeholders, but also different regions being represented. Um, so I remember like, and we discussed that a lot, like Canada during the chairship organized regional consultations and that's a, a good experience that it could be good also to, to see that in at the FOC and in different processes. Um, and I wanted to take the opportunity also to raise one main obstacle for in meaningful inclusivity and presence of, of glo global majority voices, which is the visas. So a lot of staff from APC and also people from our members couldn't come to Japan because of is visa issues. We experienced the same with negotiations of the UN in New York and in Europe too. Um, this is not like an uh, isolated thing. We see this as, a, of course, as a product of a systematic issue, um, but it's important to address that when we talk about inclusivity and majority global voices in this conversation, how that's a barrier and how to think alternatives, but also how to address the, this structural problem. Uh, those were some of the points I wanted to raise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. And I invite you, anyone else want to jump in on this question, but also bring new questions to the conversation. Ambassador. Thank you. Um, but what Ellen's, uh, it was already mentioned a number of subjects. I mentioned them too, but what Alison also uh, said was relevant that the agenda must be evolving. And the on the agenda setting is not only the presidency who is responsible for that, that's indeed to discuss that with all the involved uh, uh, not only the, 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 me the member states uh, uh, in the coalition, but indeed uh, the, the um, advisory board as well. Um, on the human rights, I would like to stress that it's important also for us governments at home to coordinate with your own other human rights departments, because human rights is, uh, you know, the, the digital threats to human rights is a vehicle, but it's uh, happening also in the real world. And we may have to be sure that it's connected in our offices as well, that we don't uh, have it as separate uh, discussion. So please involve uh, uh, all your colleagues who are uh, addressing this issue on, uh, on human rights. And on inclusivity, that's, that's actually a topic which is uh, widely discussed also in our ministry, um, the, the reduction in civic space. And I think that maybe should also be discussed. We can, I mean, we talk about meaningful inclusivity, etc. But it's a wider problem that in many countries is, there's a reduction in civic space, in uh, the possibility for NGOs to work, they being kicked out, etc. So that's also a, a serious threat. Uh, you know, we we can work on inclusivity and in, in the coalition, but we have maybe also to address this reduction in civic space also online. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if anyone wants to take the floor from the audience for commenting or bringing new issues. If I may, also a comment from my side. I think that it's very relevant in that inclusivity also that the, something that you mentioned in your intervention, Alison, related to the coordination of different uh, bodies <laughs> inside the government, as you were mentioning, in the, in the case of like human rights protection in, in different fronts but also different level of expertise, because for inclusivity also we need to create capacity. And, and one key role that the collaboration that is co uh, coordinated and created through FOC is like to bring more information about where are the right places to have those right, right coordination, because sometimes for civil society, it's difficult to figure out what is the, 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 the most appropriate interlocutor for uh, having some conversation inside the government. So the role that also the, the coalition can, uh, can have like in in facilitating that coordination internally in, in their own governments are across government is also related to facilitate that information for the uh, more effective action of the advocacy of the civil society in this issue. So uh, really interesting point on that. I don't know if anyone else want to <laughs> add uh, something in, in, in those lines or other? <laughs> Maybe Irene, do you want to jump in? So the only other thing I wanted to mention is um, even for Canada, it's hard to keep track of all the different digital and tech initiatives. Um, these used to be te mainly technical issues with some political implications, and now they've become political issues that happen to be facilitated through tech. Um, and I think if we want um, greater uh, participation from both 
global majority countries and civil society, we need to be much more specific about uh, what we want from them, the kind of engagement we want from them, and also to bring something of value to them. So whether that's greater capacity building, better understanding of, I mean, how does New York UN work? I don't think anyone really knows. Um, and also the technical expertise. So I think it's not just about what we want, um, but it, much, it needs to be much more of a two-way conversation um, between those we're trying to engage and what our goals are. Super important point, like how to bring uh, people in the process, but in something that is valuable for everyone around the table. So we have one uh, comment or question from the audience. Please go ahead, <laughs> introduce yourself and... Sure, hi, Nikki Muscati, I'm from the US Department of State. Uh, work on the FOC. I, I have both a question and a comment kind of together. You know, we spent a lot of time in our chairship thinking about how to include various voices in the decision-making process for the priorities that we had in our chairship. And um, as our Deputy Assistant Secretary Allison Peters noted, um, you know, there is a challenge for how you can bring these voices together, particularly within the global majority, because of the sheer amount of forums and processes that are happening that our governments are all engaged in. And so I guess um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Ambassador, but you know, some, uh, I am curious if you've thought a little bit about um, how you want to maybe narrow your focus um, during your chairship year next year and in that, how you're hoping or planning to engage with some of the already existing global majority voices that are within the coalition to bring them into these processes and these conversations. And then, um, not to put my own leadership on the spot, but also the Canadian government, you know, what advice might you have for the Dutch government in terms of how to engage these other voices? Of course, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about this this year, and it, you know, as it was noted, the Canadian government did uh, consultations with every region. So maybe if they're, uh, I'm interested in maybe a little bit of a back and forth there, if if you all would indulge me um, in the in the last few minutes, um, because it is really important um, that we bolster the existing voices that we have in the coalition, or else why would someone join? I would like first to listen to the recommendation of others because, like yeah. I've mentioned, I mean, I'm, I'm here to learn yeah. and I can uh, say very strong things, but without the experience within the coalition. <laughs> um, well, I'm happy to start and, and turn it over to my colleague from the government of Canada. Um, I mean, this is the, the heart of the challenge, right, in terms of expanding the tent not expanding too large where we can't get anything done, making sure that we are expanding the um, diversity of the advisory network. It would be near impossible to bring in every single voice into the advisory network, so getting that right as well is, is um, kind of a key challenge that we have. Um, I, I don't think hope is lost. I think some of it, first and foremost, in terms of engaging global majority governments, um, we have seen successes in bringing additional governments into the fold. Some are not full members yet, but may be joining, um, but we have already been in um, very intensive dialogues with them about their priorities as it relates to technology and human rights. Um, so, so there I think we learned a, a good lesson, which is um, bringing them into the discussions with other FOC members as, as partners, um, as equal footing. So at our event in the UN General Assembly, um, recently with the Secretary of State, we invited non-FOC members, some key countries that have um, Im important uh, perspectives to bring into the fold as it relates to technology policy, some which are strong democracies, strong records on human rights, but maybe um, have not engaged with the FOC previously. And so bringing them to the table to add their voices and perspectives um, has been really important to just get them interested in the work in the FOC, famili to familiarize them with the FOC's work. Um, and then following that up with capital level engagement. So as, as you know well, Nikki, you know, we have really um, enlisted the support of our ambassadors and our diplomatic corps in these key countries to continue the dialogue. It can't just be a one-off 
you know, ministerial level event in the UN, and then you know, we say, thanks so much, please join us. It really needs to be a, a constant dialogue. Um, Third, I would just say a recognition that resources are scarce, I mean, in every government, um, but some governments have more resources than others. Um, and so, you know, continuing to work with those governments that may feel like they don't have the resources to engage to both support them and, and help them perhaps um, have those resources, but also making the case of, of what's in it for them. Like, what are you gonna get out of this if you prioritize this over or s over something else? I mean, we heard a lot about the, the proliferation of different processes here. Um, s second, I would just say, you know, in relation to, to not just governments, but um, expanding the work that we're doing with civil society, the advisory network is a key source of support to us. Um, but it's certainly, and I'm sure you would agree, it shouldn't be the only source of support, right? So, um, for example, the Freedom Online Coalition, um, our, our close friends and partners in the US government, USAID, our development agency, has recently launched this week a set of donor principles in the digital age. Um, not only did we consult the advisory network, our multi-stakeholder component of the Freedom Online Coalition, um, but we went way beyond that in terms of um, consulting with civil society in key countries, building out you know broader networks of stakeholder voices from, from global majority countries in particular. And I think that was another example of how we can do this, starting with the advisory network and then sort of building out from there. Um, I would say they're also leveraging the fact that we are 38 governments and we all have our own networks. And so it shouldn't just be the chair's networks in different countries that we're consulting, but um, coming to the government of Canada or coming to the Netherlands and saying, you know, who do you know that we should talk to in these countries um, is, is really important. But um, this is, you know, the, the heart of the question that we've been asking all year. And I am sure for the Canadian government, the heart of the question they, they were asking themselves as well as chair. Thank you so much. Final thoughts on that from the ambassador from the government of Canada. <laughs> we have three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll um I'll try to be quick and uh, talk about a couple of examples. So um, during last year's um, Anga High Level Anga High Level Week, uh, we organized an event between Freedom Online Coalition, International Idea, and Media Freedom Coalition. Um, I think like being more creative with our multi-stakeholderism and multilateralism um, would also help with the capacity issue of different countries not having to join four or five different um, coalitions um, outside of the UN processes. Um, and also when we recently developed the Global Declaration on Information Integrity, um, we used uh, both International IDEA and Freedom Online Coalition um, to try to get agreement among democratic and rights respecting countries on what that would look like. Um, so different ways of trying to be creative with how we approach these things to make things easier for everyone. Um, just, uh, I think what I just realized is that the FOC is not the IGF, where there's uh, lots of like-mindedness, but there's no uh, text to be uh, negotiated or whatever. and. You hear some countries being very like-minded with us on subject of human rights, and you wonder, okay, but what's happening at your home? Um, so it's different. We truly want to be like-minded, and at the same time, we are not. We don't want to copy to be the UN in the sense that you want to include all countries and have impossible negotiations. There, you want to have a meaningful uh, uh, exchange with each other that we are uh, be able to take positions in the end to. Uh, can convince the broad majority, the global majority, uh, and, and that we indeed are effective in our work. And that's a balance we have to find, also in enlarging the group. And that's a challenge, uh, because maybe you want to have some countries, but at the same time it can be more complex. So indeed it's a, it's a delicate balance we have to find with each other and to make sure that the FOC will stay uh, effective in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all the speakers for being part of this relevant conversation today. I think we have captured relevant learnings and particularly reinforced that there are clarity in the, in the main values that's, that 
uh, stick together this coalition, the, the promotion and protection of human rights, uh, the commitment with uh, inclusive and meaningful stakeholder engagement, uh, and the need of effective coordination, and be creative and continue expanding and deepening the action that already have been developed in terms of like, all the, the interoperabilities that I was mentioning uh, at the beginning of the, of the conversation, the interoperability inside different governance bodies, between different go uh, governments that are coming and enlarging enlarge the, the coalition with the challenges that the ambassador just pointed out, of like being more diverse, uh, being mindful and, and accommodate uh, different contexts, but without sacrificing the basic values. Um, so on that note, uh, thank you very much for being part of this conversation and have a good uh, final date of IGF. <laughs>